Now we're going to look at a couple of additional examples. They are both very neat examples, very original ones. This first example comes from the textbook, uh, one of the uh, homework problems from the textbook. What we have here is a uniformly charged sphere of charge density rho, okay? Charge density rho, and radius is r, whatever, whatever that is. But to make things interesting, we're going to cut out a uniform cavity inside, okay? A uniform cavity. This uniform cavity, uh, also spherical, but it's got a size that's smaller than, than, than a bigger surface. And uh, I don't really know how big that cavity is. The only thing I know is that there is a separate between the center of the sphere, the original sphere, and the center of the cavity. And that distance from here to there, we call it A. Okay, we call it A, small a from here to there. Now, without this cavity, we know how to calculate the electric field everywhere, right? I mean, inside it's linear, outside it goes like one over r squared. We did that before, right? But my question is, what is the electric field inside the cavity? Okay, what is the electric field inside the cavity? Let's say the electric field here at this point. All right, how do we solve a problem like that? Well, with the cavity here, you no longer have spherical symmetry, right? You know, this whole thing, you break the spherical symmetry unless the cavity is centered right here. Otherwise, you don't have the spherical symmetry and you cannot apply Gauss's law directly. But the question is, can we modify this problem so that we can still use the uh, result of Gauss's law? Well, the only thing that makes trouble for us is that there is a cavity here. What if I filled it up with some positive charge rho? Then I don't have the problem anymore, right? I don't have the problem anymore. But of course, in reality, there is a cavity. So is there a way I can equivalently think of the electric field as the combination of a fully filled sphere and this cavity? Well, the answer is yes, it is. Yes, we can do that. First of all, we fill it up. Okay, so you have an entirely uniform sphere. You know how to calculate the electric field there if the, if the cavity is not present. And then, of course, we have to minus, we have to subtract the electric field produced by a charge density rule in this region because, in reality, there is no charge there. Okay? So, once again, the electric field of this point, at this point inside the cavity, E, equals E1 minus E2. That is the key point here. What's E1? E1 is the electric field of this sphere without a cavity, what's E2? E2 is the electric field of a smaller sphere of charge density rho because that sphere does not really exist so you know I should take that away from the original expression from E1. It is quite simple to calculate E1 and E2. First of all it's E1. Okay. For E1, imagine there is no cavity. Okay, there's no cavity. So let me draw a line here. Okay. Uh, and this radius, uh, this distance from here, there we call it R. Okay, we call it R. Do we know how to calculate the electric field at this point due to the entire sphere without a cavity? Sure, we know. E1 equals 2. Okay. If you recall from one of the previous examples, rho over 3 epsilon naught. Okay. Rho over 3 epsilon naught. R. In fact, let me use this vector here because if rho, if rho is positive, uh, the direction of the E field is really away. So this is I'm going to assign a vector like this. All right? Okay. That's E1. And uh, um, the uh, this particular result, we got that before. Okay. If you if you don't recall that, uh, we got that uh, in. Uh, Example two, you can take a you can take a look at that. You will you will find that. Okay. Now, uh, the only difference between the expression in example two and this expression was that we worked out uh, we work out q q equals rho times uh, the volume, and you will get that expression. Quite simple. Okay, it's linear, as you recall. Now, what about e two? What's e two again? E two is the electric field produced by a smaller sphere, okay, a smaller sphere of the same charge density rule. We have to subtract E2 because this sphere does not really exist. There is no charge here. So what's E2 equal to? E2. Same deal. 
rho over 3 epsilon naught times what? Times that vector. We call it R prime, shall we? We call it R prime. It's from the center of the cavity to that point, R prime. Okay, R prime. You see, the reason why this problem is quite elegant is because both electric fields depend linearly on the vector r and r prime. That way, when I add them up, interesting things will happen. Okay, let's see. E equals to e1 minus e2. So it's rho over 3 epsilon naught, and then that's the common factor, r minus r naught. Okay, now let's look at that. This is r. This is r prime. Okay. Let me draw another vector from here to there, joining the two centers. We call this vector A. You know the magnitude is A, right? From the center of the larger sphere to the center of the cavity. Isn't it true that A plus R prime equals R, right? A plus R prime equals R. So therefore, what's R minus R prime? R minus R prime is just A. So you see, this equals to rho over 3 epsilon naught times A. Unbelievable. With a spherical cavity cut out a uniformly charged sphere. Within the cavity, you in fact get a uniform electric field, believe it or not. You see, it's entirely uniform, and it's nothing to do with the location inside the cavity. It's just a constant. And as a special case, when A equals zero, the electric field inside the cavity is zero. Now that, actually, we know. Because when A is equal to zero, the cavity is cut like this, okay? It's concentric with the larger sphere. So you get something like this, when A equal to zero. Well, I didn't draw it very well, but you know what I mean. The cavity is concentric with uh, with the larger sphere, and uh, once you're inside the cavity, anywhere, what's the electric field? Zero, okay? Because you know that's part of the uh, Newton shell theorem. But uh, if it's off center, then that's what you get. So that's a neat way of getting a uniform electric field from two uh, from from a spherical charge. All right, let's look at our last example, which is also quite original and elegant. That's also from the textbook. OK, so what we have here is an x-axis, very, very long x-axis. OK, and there is a charge, charge Q. It enters from a very, very far away location with a high speed v naught along the x-axis. OK, and somewhere here in waiting is a fixed charge, big Q. They have the same sign so that they can repel each other. The distance between the big Q and the x-axis is d. Okay. Now, as a result, as the charge moves at high speed, as it goes in, it's going to be repelled by that charge. So eventually, uh, it's going to end up somewhere there. Okay, somewhere there. Okay. So, what is my question? My question is: As this charge exits over there. What angle does it make with the x-axis? Okay, I want to know this angle. That's theta. That's what I want to know. So come from positive infinity, uh, negative infinity goes to positive infinity very, at very high speed, okay? And it's going to be deflected by that charge. And of course, the, the force between these two charges varies all the time, okay? Varies from point to point. I want to know what's the, what is the final direction of the velocity. I want to know what this angle is. All right, now that sounds like an impossible problem because uh, you are dealing with a complicated expression for, for the final angle because there is a variable force here. But don't worry, let's, let's try to do that. Um, you know, the fact that the speed is very high has something to do with the simplification. Um, so the speed is very high, that means it takes a f very little time for it to zip by, okay, for it to zip by. And during that time, uh, we can say that there is very little time for the velocity v naught to change in x direction. On the other hand, the y direction. Initially, there is no velocity. Finally, there is a velocity. We cannot ignore that. Okay. So, as a good approximation, we say the velocity in x direction is pretty much just still v naught. Right. To get this angle theta, all we have to find is v y. That's what we need to find. V y, the vertical direction. Vy was zero to begin with. I want to know the final value. So how much is V not, Vy equal to? Well, do not try to use something like uh, V equals A times T because A is not a constant, okay? 
the acceleration of this charge in a vertical direction, in a y direction, is not a constant, by the way. We call this y direction. It is not a constant because the force in the y direction is not a constant. So, how does one calculate that? Well, um, we know the uh, impulse momentum theorem, which is just a variation of Newton's second law. In the y direction, we know that uh, uh, dPy dt equals Fy. And uh, Py is just m times Vy, so I can get this is just d of m Vy dt equals Fy. And uh, from that, I can find Vy. Okay, what's Vy equal to? It's just 1 over m Fy dt. All right? T is, an, is the time duration between here and there. I have to integrate over this entire range, right? Assuming the initial velocity in the y direction is zero. So that's how I integrate it. It's just Newton's second law, right? I mean, uh, this is the impulse divided by the mass. You get the final velocity. Now, the question is, how does one calculate this integral? Okay, F is the electric force, so we know that equals to the electric charge, Q, times the electric field produced by this guy, okay, produced by this guy, E, in the y direction, dt. Okay, so the next step is how to calculate this. You know, E, Y, that's the y component of the electric field everywhere at every moment, and that changes all the time because the, the thing goes further and further away from the charge Q. Okay, so it is not a constant. All right? And that's the uh, uh, tricky part of the problem. But this is also where it gets more interesting. Remember, this chapter is about Gauss's law. How does this problem have anything to do with Gauss's law, you wonder? Right? How does it have anything to do with Gauss's law? Well, this is for Gauss's law, you need an integral over you know, an electric flux, right? But this is no electric flux, is it? This is not electric flux. This is just E over dt. So some will have to change dt to dA, the area. How does one do that? Well, dt is the time it takes for this guy to move from a certain place to another place. But primarily, it moves along the x direction. It hardly moves the y direction because it goes very fast in the x direction. Okay, so it, it hardly has any time to move up and down the y direction. And therefore, uh, dt, we know how to, how to find that. dt really is just um, dx over v naught. Pretty much. I mean, it's an approximation because the speed in the x direction also changes, but not by much. Okay, so um, this tells us that Vy equals to Q over mv naught Ey dx. Okay, now things get more interesting now. It gets warmer. Ey dx. Dx is not dA. Is not. We want to turn this into dA, an area, so that becomes some sort of a electric flux, which we can use Gauss's law to solve, right? Dx is just the distance between here and there. It is not equal to the flux yet. Uh, it is not equal to the area yet. I need to multiply this by another dimension, all right? And how does one do that? Well, you notice that this electric field is produced by this guy right here, okay? It is produced by, by this guy right here. And uh, because of the symmetry of, of, of the electric field, uh, well, it has, doesn't have a lot of symmetry, but we do know that if we were to draw a cylinder, okay? We were to draw a cylinder with this as our axis, all right? This is a line passing through point Q and it's parallel to the x-axis, then everywhere on that cylinder, if we were to cut a little cylindrical strip like this, a circular strip like this, then everywhere on that strip, the electric field does exhibit certain type of symmetry. The, uh, the component of the electric field that is perpendicular to the strip has the same magnitude throughout. Recall the symmetry here? Okay. And what we need here from this integral is EY. That's a component that happens to be perpendicular to the x-axis. You see that? Okay. And everywhere on that surface, okay, the radius is D. Right? The radius is D. Uh, the perpendicular component has the same exact magnitude because of the location of the charge Q being on the axis of symmetry. So I can modify this. Okay. I can modify let me multiply dx 
by 2 pi d, which is a circumference. So dx times 2 pi d, as you know, is the area of this little strip, okay? And then this just dA, right? So what's E dot dA then? What's EY dA then? That would be the flux through the entire side of this very, very long, infinitely long Gaussian cylinder, right? So all you have to do is divide it by 2 pi d. So then you get Q over mv naught over 2 pi d, and what's left is the electric flux through the Gaussian cylinder, and we all know what that is. That is just equal to Q over epsilon naught. So we replace phi e with Q over epsilon naught. That gives you Vy, and once we get Vy, we all know what Vx is just proximal V naught, then we get to know what this angle is. So here is a neat application of Gauss's law, once again.